Hello, everybody, and welcome back to CobalCon 2024. Um, hey, I'm here with some amazing, amazing people who have helped make this, I mean, make everything for for Cobalt Press, for <laughs> Tales of the Valiant. But specifically, the thing that we are talking about today is the Monster Vault. How does it yes. feel? All three of you, all of this work that you that that you put in, <laughs> well over a year's worth of work, finally out for everyone to experience. How's it, it feels feel? Great. Yeah. Yes, it's great. at last we can babble about it. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to keep a lid on something that's pretty exciting like this, and uh, everyone knows I'm a monster holic, and it hasn't changed. And and I have to say, Mark and Megan have enabled me, uh, and and the monster holics among us. So it feels great. Yeah, Megan, what do you think? Are you just glad it's done and out there to share? Yeah, that yeah. Yeah, it's mostly like this sense of anticipation for like the past few months, you know, because printing's a long process. So just sitting here like waiting and waiting and waiting. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they're going to see it. They're going to see it. They're going to see it. Oh, it's out here. Um, so it's been an exciting week for sure in the Cobalt Warrens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. So, I mean, first and foremost, you know, if we're getting into the Monster Vault, my first question for you is, what inspired the creation of the Monster Vault for Tales of the Valiant? Ooh, 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 I know this one. Uh, <laughs> every time we finish doing a monster book, we say, wow, that was so hard, Toma B, so hard. And we, we kind of walk away, right, and, and let the monsters explode and plunder the countryside, and, and that's great. <laughs> we just like, yeah, okay. We won't do that again for a while. We've learned our lesson. And then someone says, yeah, but what if we did another one? And it, that's about all it takes for me to say, yeah, let's. <laughs> and and I turn to Mark and I say, you know, 300 new monsters. We can, we can illustrate that, right? We can get some artists. I immediately get super excited and think, ugh. <laughs> that's a lot of monsters that's a lot of artists working with yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but i i think for this one i don't know megan you can tell me if i'm wrong but this one for monster vault it was like back to basics right it's let's go do the classic monsters put the cobalt spin on them and for the history of the company we've always depended on like other core monster books right like you need an ogre go over here you you know you need a dragon go over there um, but then we realized, oh, we're going to need to do this for Tales of the Valiant. We're going to need that core collection of goblins and dragons and orcs and, and kind of the regular stuff that you expect um, in, in your tabletop game, plus things that you don't expect. I don't know. How did, what do you think, Megan? Like, yeah, like it was, it's definitely fun to to revisit some of those classics, right? And to go in and just be like, all right, so we need an ogre. But the fun thing about um, working with something like the SRD was that there was no lore, right? So for us, that meant that we got to go and like tackle these in a new way, right? Yes. So it's not just an ogre anymore, right? Like it's not just an owl bear anymore. So um, that I think was, was the most fun, was just getting to like revisit a lot of the classics and explore something new with them yeah and argue about what it should be yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we've all been playing a long us. time we and have so... when we all have assumptions about well an ogre is kind of like this mm -hmm. no no an ogre is more like that no no an ogre should be allowed to be like you know a bouncer at the bar or what like different ideas about what what it really means to be the big smash em up guy mm -hmm. um and I think those discussions were really fruitful because we kind of agreed on them, mostly on the mechanical side, mm -hmm. I think. Like that's yeah. SRD based and fifth edition D D shines through some of that, plus all the new stuff. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, it was exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you all kind of like, you're talking about the ogre, but like, what are some of the other like classic fantasy monsters that people are going to be able to find in the monster vault? And like, what are some of those changes, not just mechanically, but also like 
aesthetically and like how like the art of those changed and how that informed each other there there's a ton but there's one that for me i i am a huge fan my favorite adventure of all time is, is a first edition uh series a trilogy called the sinister secret of salt marsh love that adventure and in the final adventure the the, the big final enemy you know spoiler alert for a 30 year old adventure are solid <laughs> i love you know, underwater stuff. I love Saga. So one of the things I loved was kind of reinventing how they looked, you know, get a cool, oh, yes. art, make a little more sharky. Um, so that was fantastic. I mean, you know, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but there's something coming out where it even, we do more with Saga. But anyway, that was just one example of reinventing and putting a cobalt spin on something that I'm, I'm just giddy about. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think uh, in the alpha release, a lot of people got to see some of the new art and a lot of the new takes on things like the owlbear can now glide, right? We didn't give them a true flying speed, but they can be airborne. They um, plummet with style and grace. Right? <laughs> well, grace is as graceful as a bear can be, I suppose. <laughs> but I think some of the ones that people haven't seen yet or they're just now diving into because Monster Vault's now out, um, I think the three big ones that are classics that we had a lot of fun with were giants, oozes, and hags. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, because a lot of those have, like for hags, they had a pretty clear identity, um, but we kind of ramped that up to 11. And then for oozes, they had practically no identity. Oozes were, well, it's the gray one or the yellow one or the black one, which is They're, not a lot of distinction I, when you're trying know, to pick Color is an identity a little bit. The right. green <laughs> slime. Well, what, uh, what, when you think yellow ooze, what do you immediately think the abilities would be? What what, what ability does yellow give, right? So yeah. we definitely wanted to change that up, give them some clear identities. Um, and similarly with the giants, because a lot of the giants, at least in the SRD, um, were very similar. They all had a rock throwing attack. They all had a two handed weapon. Uh, and then some of them could fly, some of them couldn't. And that's pretty much it. Some of them had a little bit of spell casting. Um, you know, so there wasn't in, in, in the mechanics itself, they didn't have clear identities. And so being able to revisit the lore allowed us to create those identities. And yes. then from those new identities, give them new mechanics related to it. So like the cloud giant, for example, doesn't throw a rock. It has a wind blast because what rocks are they holding up in the clouds? Right? <laughs> rocks are heavy. It's hard to fly with a bag full of rocks. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so now because they're the cloud giant and there's all this lore about how they have palaces up in the clouds, they now have abilities that, that tie into that. They can create clouds and they can make clouds solid, right? Mm -hmm. So now there's, a, there's mechanics that support their lore of we walk on clouds for a living, right? It's not just, they can do it just because they can do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's now stuff that supports it. Uh, so this little little changes like that, that, um, that I think were the most fun. Yeah. Thinking uh, off of that, another thing that I think are, 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 our, uh, are our dragons. Both yes, I was going to get to dragons. Yeah, okay, well, I, did, I didn't say anything. Wolfgang, do you have any thoughts? I do. Well, <laughs> first of all, the art for the dragons is just stunning and beautiful. Like, so, we shared the black dragon and the alpha, and everybody said, wow, what a great creature for the marsh or the swamp. Like, that black dragon is kind of badass. And um, it looks like it belongs in a swamp, too. That's the yep. thing. It's mm -hmm. a little right? more slithery. It's, I, I don't know, I'm... I'm thrilled with all the dragon art we've got. And then we decided, well, you know, primary colors, yellow's not in there. What if we put in a new one, right? The Monster Vault shouldn't just be the classic chromatics. Let's add something new. And and the Void Dragon is kind of iconic for Cobalt Press. Why don't we just put it in the Monster Vault so everyone's and got it? Cool. it, it looks, looks cool. It looks cool. <laughs> you you so, gotta keep that art because it's awesome. Yes. And we've done visually mark i think the artists all delivered and i know there were only one or two people doing dragons but wow but then on top of that right like the lore behind it and the abilities behind them some of it's familiar like types of breath weapons we didn't say change all that but the green dragon for instance um I think it went back and forth a little on the lore like at one point it was sort of a mad scientist full stop and then now it's a little more like an alchemist, I want to say, right? Like they still have some experimenting and, and they're curious. 
And it's like, well, if green dragons are curious creatures that like to experiment and brew up potions full of halfling guts, well, that makes them interesting, right? <laughs> it's, it's a quirk. So just, they're green because they live in the forest, obviously. Right. <laughs> and I mean, there's nothing wrong with green lives in the forest. That's still there. But, but it's nice to talk a little about motivation, like, if dragons all have curiosity, if dragons all have hobbies and interests, what are those like? And what kind of trouble do they make? Because they just need another batch of halfling guts, right? Like, it's for an experiment. Don't you people understand? I'm digging up the Shire for a reason. For a reason. And you guys can't see it because you only live like 50 years. I am operating on a grand scale over here. Yeah. Right? So that lore is, the... is oh, fun. I think it inspires adventures, right? I think yeah. it, it gives them personality and a twist. And if you're the game master and you're trying to represent that that dragon, it gives you a few more hooks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mechanically, we also wanted each dragon to feel different, right? Because uh, dragons, you can't get past, you can't get away from claw claw bite, right? Like dragons, it's always going to be claw claw bite and a breath weapon. Uh, but we did want to give them a little bit clearer identity in their mechanics as well. So each one has a new passive ability, at least at the higher ages. Wormlings are all still similar, but Wormlings They're all so have... so cute. Yes. <laughs> to the but yellow dragon the like, now. I love them. <laughs> yes, they're adorable. And they're scattered all throughout the book, too. So you guys got to go find all the Wormlings. It's great. But uh, they'll pounce at you, which that's the thing. One of the new mechanics for the wormlings is they all have this pounce. So when they're really little, they're very lion-like. They're going to be like stalking in wherever they're stalking, and then they're going to come out and jump at you. But when they get bigger, they don't really need to worry as much about I'm hiding in tall grass and jumping on you. I'm big. I don't care. So their new passive feature when they get older is tied to their breath weapon. So for some of them, if their breath weapon is not available, because 5e gives us this recharge mechanic, mm -hmm. which allows us to have a lot of fun playing with it. So in the recharge, when this breath weapon is available, some dragons have this, like, like the red dragon has this, like, aura of heat because all of this heat and magma and stuff is built up inside of its body. So then you're getting burned just by being near it. And then that goes away if it uses its breath weapon. So that adds a little bit of tacticalness for the game master. And then on the flip side, some of the dragons have this aura only when the breath weapon hasn't been used. Mm -hmm. So then the game master, depending on what that um, aura is, is incentivized to use the breath weapon more often. So you get this fun little tactical, and then sometimes the players have to stay away from the dragon and hit it from afar. Sometimes they want to be close to it and come in, right? So mm -hmm. it's it has just that extra little layer, um, yeah. which I think makes them extra fun. Yeah, like it's, I, I mean, everything about that, like just inspires so much right there's like so much that you can pull from that either in the tactics of combat or like even like as wolfgang was saying like in the story of it like in giving them like clear identities almost like feels even more like if you if you wanted to do a game where you were like monster hunting or whatever and you were building a codex a, a vault of monsters one would say it's like <laughs> giving you clear identities of like okay we're at this town there's some stuff going on what are the clear signs of things that are happening and what mm -hmm. monster could we align that to to like help us prepare for like okay we now know that there's this you know oh there's clear signs of like experimentation and like like weird like alchemical uses but also big claw marks and stuff hmm, maybe we're looking at a green dragon that's in the area or something like that's that's so cool right that's I and it also that. encourages more researching too because we have in the player's guide uh, we have the researching downtime so it gives more mm -hmm. of a reason for that right if you know more about the monster you can kind of see the signs in the area and then you can go in with that knowledge so it's easier not necessarily easier to fight but you you know what to expect you're yeah. more informed yeah that's so good um, so we've been talking about a lot of classic monsters, right? We've been talking about dragons sure. and ogres and goblins and so on and so forth. Are there any new monsters that people can look forward mm -hmm. to seeing in there? Any, anything like any fantasy, maybe science fantasy, like what, what new stuff can people be excited for? Yes. Bunches. Um, <laughs> a lot. Too much. Um, <laughs> Well, no, no. I mean, we put in the yellow dragon and the void dragon as, as sort of classic fantasy monsters that fit a niche not covered by the existing dragon types. But we also put in a section that's a little more science fantasy, sort of a couple of robot creatures, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and mechadrons. And the mechadrons, which are, again, sort of robotic, little 
mechanical uh, creatures that have a grand vision and a grand plan, and no one understands it but them. Um, <laughs> it's just fun. And they've got this very clear hierarchy from, you know, sort of the very simple mechadrons up to um, the more a mechadron prime, which which is missing. Anyway, there's the lore parts of that. The um, missing or is it just temporarily omitted? Yeah, well, it's not, there's well, no least, stats for maybe it. Maybe at some point in the future. I know, right? Like, mm, yeah, we can't get too far ahead of ourselves, but it does seem like the search for the Mechadron Prime might be a thing someday. Um, Ooh, okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> maybe someday soon. <laughs> um, there's hints of this actually in the Guide to the Labyrinth. So that's where some of this other lore comes from, which. Um, isn't a monster book it's sort of talking about the assumed setting of tales of the valiant but there's there's a section in there about the mechadrons and what they're up to mm -hmm. um and it's like a couple of paragraphs mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um additional hints about where some of those monsters fit in the grand scheme do you have a new monster you like megan Oh goodness! I hate it when people ask my favorites. oh sorry it's i'm like just gonna put you on the spot my children because i have I had know. to like yeah work with all of them um i nominate the the chull is that how you say them C -H oh, the... Chull, yes yes just the, the art i love the art for them and and the they're so bizarre <laughs> it's like a whole yeah, the yeah. fiends yeah yeah Ooh, okay wait yeah, please the... describe wait what what <laughs> you can't just they just can't sort of well, you know how cave fish are invisible and you can see their bones, right? Now imagine a demon that's kind of like that. Um, they're they're semi-transparent. They're opaque, not opaque. They're yeah, just imagine evil, uh, evil gummy bears. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, they with, don't look quite weapon. that cuddly. Yeah, the art. Yeah, it was that was one of those ones where you know when I first got the art briefs and I was reading, I'm thinking. Oh, okay. We're making the artist's life hard. Is, but then when the art started coming back, I was like, oh, oh, okay. No, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's... So, yeah, I, I love them. Right. Yeah, they're a new they're category of themes. Like yeah. Mercenaries and stuff of the plane. So they're like, you pay us. We'll switch sides. You know, it's it's great. Right. Oh, my God. The, what is that saying from Fall? If the caps are there, we do not care. <laughs> You've been playing so much Fall. <laughs> I, I have been, perhaps, a little. I blame that TV show. But, I mean, stuff like that, the robots I mentioned earlier, I think mm -hmm. there's, like, a little warden robot as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's stuff that is Fallout adjacent. There's no radioactive rad scorpions or anything, but um, but there's a lot of monsters crammed into the monster vault. Um, oh, yeah, we try to make sure that the lore stayed open enough so that they could apply to any world, as long as the world was assumed to be fantasy. Mm -hmm. um you know so there's there's different types of fantasy there's high fantasy low fantasy you mentioned science fantasy earlier right so we wanted to make sure that the lore was open enough that you could see this creature in your world right or in a world that you wanted to, mm -hmm. to play in and the mechanics typically reflect that mostly because the mechanics are very much about reinforcing the creature's theme so as long as your world features the biome that creature would normally be found in right Mm -hmm. then you should be fine. Now, if a creature that has, uh, like the Grick, for example, is an underground creature with stone camouflage, if you don't have anything underground in your world, maybe the Grick doesn't fit as well. Um, but otherwise, that would be like the only limit to something like the Grick, is that you have to conceivably have an underworld or an under underground area that, that they could be in. But mm -hmm. otherwise, most of the creatures can be easily placed into any type of fantasy world. Yeah. There's so also another... some really cool new uh, planar stuff, like the Astro Devour, things yeah. like that, which is some... some yeah, on the total opposite of the big planar stuff, Mark, is the the new monsters that might slide by you if you're not paying attention. We added um, sort of leveled up versions of some of the humanoid baddies, right? Ooh. Like there's a... Is it the Hobgoblin General or yeah. Conjurer? Yeah, there's a commander and a conjurer for the Hobgoblin. Uh, right, the which... Bear has... Oh, that Bugbear Champion. Yeah, right? Champion, that's what it was. Which is, like, it's just sort of a leveled up Bugbear, but goodness, you don't want to get on its wrong side. And so it's 
it's kind of expanding the range of challenge uh, for a creature like a bugbear or a group of hobgoblins by putting in some leaders, some champions, um, additional oh, spellcasters. Yeah, spellcasters for these. So those are additions to the monster vault. Like they're not a new concept. Like hobgoblin isn't new, but uh, the commander and the conjurer are. Just like a, we can't not talk about the hop the uh, the kobolds. You know, we got yes, we have a kobold witch and a kobold. You know, I can't think what all they are. I think there's mechanist, a, mechanist, mechanist. That, yeah, so yeah, it's not just kobold. Yep. Well, of course, there's then, no such thing. It's just yeah, a well, kobold. And, and like Wolfgang said, it kind of expands how long you can use these creatures, right? So instead of, oh yes, Kendo. Oh, no, 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 please continue. Please continue. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, so instead of it being like Goblin is only what your level one players face, right? Now Goblin can be something that's a threat to level three or even level five um, just because they've got the Goblin captain. And then because Goblins work with things like bugbears and hobgoblins, you could have an entire level one to 10 campaign that's very Goblin focused and Goblin themed with all of these various Goblinoids that we've added in, right? Um, I know the lizard folk is another one that got that same treatment. Yes. So now you can have an entire village of lizard folk that's not just here's the one stat block, right? Like now you've got like a chieftain and you've got like a shaman, right? Like you've got these other peoples that would populate that area. That's yeah, so good. It's so good. It's just so good. What else can I say other than it's so good? It is. <laughs> the deeper you dig it's into hot. it, the more you scratch at it, like the more you see, oh, oh, this is good. There's just so <laughs> much. There's just so much there to build off of as like, again, as I will keep talking about as a forever game master, stuff like this and like just being able to flip through the book, find any monster, even just reading through its lore and just going, oh, OK, now I have a million ideas of like how to use this and how to like it's I'm so excited, so excited. I, I had that experience so many times doing the layout for the book. You know, I'd, I was you know intimately familiar with the art. But mm -hmm. then as I was going through, I don't know how many times I would just sort of stop and go, oh, Oh, that's cool. <laughs> you know, I have to go back to work. You know, and then I go a little more uh, to a new creature. I start reading it. Oh, wow. How cool is that? Oh, no, anyway, get back to work. <laughs> the entire book, I just kept thinking, oh, that's really nice. That's my fault. I'm sorry, Wolfgang. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, moving uh, uh, on, like, so we're talking about, like, all of these amazing monsters, right? Um what are go, what are some of your favorite unique features that you've brought to some of uh, the monsters either new monsters or old monsters that like i don't know so something that you find yourself particularly like inspired by if there are any oh uh, there's a couple from the alpha that i was fond of and i'm sure megan and mark have different ones but um making petrification a uh, a weakness for trolls was a, a fond addition of mine from the alpha. And I think it's made it through to the current printing um, because it's an old bit of Scandinavian lore and it shows up in Lord of the Rings and trolls turning to stone is fun. I would often house rule it before, but now with tales of the valiant and the monster, I don't have to house rule it. It's right it's there. It's just a part right? of the game now. It's just part of the game. And it's not every troll is subject to petrification, but, they could be, and in my game, it's probably more likely than not, right? <laughs> um, and another one was uh, the giving skeletons a ranged attack. I think they have. So when I think of skeletons, I think of Ray Harryhausen and, and that sort of stop motion animation from um, from that era of very old movies where we didn't have a lot of CGI. Jason but Harry Clash the Titans was awesome. Right. Okay. Right, but Clash of the Titans was awesome, and it's like okay, uh, and was it Jason and the? Argonauts? I think it's, I yeah. saw a clip of that very scene of him fighting the skeletons earlier today. Right, and it's still <laughs> kind of terrifying. They move in this awful, awful way. Like, no, that's not a living thing. That's a skeleton, and it's moving. Make it stop. Um, <laughs> so our skeletons got a little bit of an updown, and they're like, they're the wimpiest little thing, right? Like, what do you fight as a beginning adventurer? Well, rats skeletons maybe some goblins um the and i think we can archer the skeleton archer right Which like suddenly cool. they're a ranged threat yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so little things like that that can take something pretty straightforward and just give it a little more variety 
I love that stuff. Yeah, and the skeleton's got a new counterattack too that I think keys yeah. off of their hit points or it has a recharge. Yeah. I think it might have a recharge. Ooh. So every now and then you might be like, oh, it's a skeleton archer. I'll just shoot it and then it can hit you back with its bow. Yes. That's the scary part. You think you're hiding over here away from the skeleton. You're yeah. not safe. You're not safe. It saw <laughs> that arrow safe. coming. <laughs> That's so good. And it's like, and it's something like, yeah, could you just make a skeleton, give it a bow? Sure. But like, it's the extra oomph that mm -hmm. really, right? really helps bring it together. And I know you talked in the about the player's guide and and probably people saying here heroes get all these options oh this is so great for character building and here we are talking about the monster vault saying yeah you're gonna need those because <laughs> <laughs> the monsters are a little meaner or have more options too yeah and, and one of the things i like is about the book too and it's not even an art thing you know usually monster books are basically alpha in a, you know, an encyclopedia of monsters that's pretty much it but in the monster vault there's a whole first section which is you know you know counter building and just like all kinds of really cool guidance before you even get to the first you know to the yeah. avalanche which is the first creature um but i will bring it back to art i also i love in that section the uh the two-page spread thing we did that shows the sizes you know, an example. Yes, I just, I love the size that. chart is fantastic. Yeah, from, from I think Pixie or, or Sprite all the way up to Gargantuan Dragon. You know, oh. but just seeing that visually represented is is so helpful. I just I love that piece. But that's in that whole section, which I think is is just so invaluable. I think GMs are going to just love that first section. Yeah, that, I mean, that leads us into the next question. What, what are the tools in the Monster Ball that uh, are, are there to help game masters create encounters using the monsters in it? And, like, what kind of guidance does it provide as far as, like, you know, how to build an encounter, you know, how to, you know, all of that, all of that good stuff that game masters, especially newer game masters, have a hard time with when they first start. Yeah, so chapter one, uh, we have some really great just how to build an encounter, essentially. Uh, so like the that section Mark was talking about was basically how do you use monsters and why, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the, the questions that we answered in those first three chapters. Well, the chapter two is explaining the stat block mostly, but chapter one tells you about how to build an encounter. And we get a table of, of encounter benchmarks. So based on your character's level, based on what kind of creatures you want to throw at them, um, what what the maximum CR that your players can handle, how you should kind of put CRs together to to create an encounter so that you're not murdering your play well, murdering characters. We don't murder players. You're not murdering <laughs> characters. That's a future book. <laughs> right? yeah. oh, gosh. I mean, some of the books are big enough that you probably, you know, you probably could. It's a two, two three but, pound uh, book. But I mean, that stuff is incredibly useful for beginners, but honestly going through it, reminded me oh yeah there is a way to sort of gauge difficulty and and we've spent a lot of time over many years at cobalt press thinking about challenge rating and encounter difficulty and a bunch of that is distilled in this chapter as examples and rules of thumb and here's how far you can push before you're likely to just wipe everybody out right like there's some good guidance there about which monsters play well with other monsters um and if you're just like, I want to do something with Undead, but I'm kind of, you know, tapped out for ideas, you can just go read the Undead section and say, oh, yeah, hey, that's neat. That's neat. Yeah, so, and that's that's the chapter, the third chapter talks the about breaks down by type. Um, so, yeah, the first first chapter has Encounter and third chapter, and that's what you're talking about, Wolfgang, with the yep. section about Undead that explains, like, what an Undead is, where you normally find them. Um, so it gives you a little bit more guidance on... A, what the difference between a monstrosity and a humanoid is, right? Or a monstrosity and a beast, but then also gives you examples of where they might be found, how you might want to use them in your game, right? Like the average elephant probably isn't wandering the plains, right? You know, the average beast is like, you know what? Magic's kind of scary. I'm not going to be near that, right? So they're going to be in areas that aren't covered in magical things. But then if you've got a magical rift to a plane, well, now you might find some of these planar creatures, right? Um, yep. And that it gives you some examples of like terrain and stuff that you can use and even has examples of encounters that might occur in specific types of terrain. Yeah. And allies. I mean, terrain is nice, but I'm, 
I feel pretty comfortable saying, I think I know that a bear will appear in the woods or the mountains, mm -hmm. but what might be with the bear? Well, an ogre or a hill giant, right? Like some of those combinations and connections are fun too. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think that's, that's great, especially if you're just looking to noodle on some new things. Um, often just flipping through the monster section will do it, but sometimes you're trying to build something more complicated or more... I don't know, a little richer, a little deeper, or just something that your players won't expect because they know all your GMing tricks. Um, <laughs> use some of our tricks. We're kobolds. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, in that, we uh, that those, the ally section you're talking about, we have tables for each of the creature types now that lists all the yes. creatures. But then, yes, lists like groups of allies. So now you know like what kind of creatures typically hang out with this creature, right? So you can kind of build those encounters so it isn't just... Here's a pile of undead, I guess, right? Now now you've got some undead and some other stuff um, all together. Which one is it? I always get this wrong. Is it the Wraith or the White that is the lieutenant to necromancers? I the, love white, that. the White is. It's the it's CR the white. lieutenant. I love that lore change because yes. I just ran a giant necromancer campaign and I, I needed lieutenants. And now it's sort of in there officially like these guys they're good at hurting other undead and getting them to do what the villain needs them to do right it gives them an, an additional role that's fun yep. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh yeah we definitely took a lot of the the lore pieces and just ramped them up to 11 like some creatures that kind of had a little bit of like we think it kind of works this way and it's like no no we're gonna definitely say it totally works this way you know like the shadow can now attach to somebody's shadow right Oh. You know, it can jump off of a wall and hide in their shadow and hang out with them for a bit, right? That's it's, it's like mechanically a supported. <laughs> yes. Right? It's like, all right, we're just gonna hang out for a bit and then uh I'm just gonna hit you because you're right here, right? Why not? That's I, I think <laughs> so good. I love the shadow. One of my favorite monsters personally. And I'm very excited right? to it... hear that. <laughs> and they now I think have spider climb that previously didn't. So like shadows couldn't actually be on walls previously. And I was like, that makes no sense. So we're, they actually now can be on a wall. Mm -hmm. Which they always should have been. But yeah, that it, nobody thought that through. Actually, I think Ettercap also picked up. Uh, spider climb, yes. Cause spider it climb. Didn't. And the art on the Ettercap is amazing. It looks so much more spidery and I love it. Like it actually looks like it should be hanging out with spiders. There's right. a wrong book but game master's guide there's a, a new editor cap illustration where he's it's coming down at you like from above and it's oh. doing the spider climb thing yeah. yes yeah. yeah it's really cool oh I spoiler for the game master guide but, i mean i think those sorts of small mechanical changes can have a real nice effect in the way you stage an encounter mm -hmm. and in just how much you scare your players i mean good scared but but scared but um, it's doing what? It's hanging from the ceiling. I thought only vampires could do that. Right. No. <laughs> no, it's no, no longer hanging from the ceiling. It's dropping on you. Yes. <laughs> Roll for it's hanging on the ceiling. You failed your perception, so. In right. here we are. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> um, well, now, we've talked about all of the tools and stuff that, like, you've added on to monsters, right? And like some sure. of the guidance for game masters to be able to run them. One of the great things about TOV is a new mechanic given to GMs yes. uh, to allow them a, a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more, uh, another tool in their pocket to help make uh, encounters maybe just that much more dangerous. And that's the doom mechanic. Yeah. Uh, hey. Would you like to speak on that a little bit? Yeah, so Doom had a handful of different iterations during our playtest. Uh, for a while, it was an extra resource on monsters, um, which ultimately playtest was like, I don't need to keep track of player actions and legendary actions and recharge and Doom on top of all of this. Uh, so, you know, and, and it, it's a fair point, right? Game masters have a lot to keep track of. They don't want to have to also keep track of point pools on each individual. Uh, so Doom, some of the changes we made is that uh, Doom is now just an optional resource. And it's also a player, or not a player, a game master side resource. So yeah. it's these points that you as a game master have based on the level of the encounter. And then you can use them for a variety of things. Uh, you can use them for, I have the list somewhere. Yes. 
You can use them to give a creature advantage on an attack roll. So if your yes. player's like, you've got your fighter with that's wearing plate, and that dragon's like, I just cannot hit this tin can. Well, you know, now you can use a point to give them advantage, right? Um, you can also give disadvantage to a PC on a save if you want. You know, you're I like, this guy one. keeps passing. I love that one so much. Right? <laughs> I really want this passing. guy to be charmed so bad by the right? vampire. I'm spending the point. <laughs> right? You know, that, that cleric is too hardy. You need to fail this save. Um, and then the, the, the third thing is once per encounter, you can let a creature recharge an ability automatically. So if you really want the dragon to breathe fire twice in a row, you can. Um, you have to spend one of your points to do it, but you can totally do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the, the three core aspects of Doom. Uh, and yeah. then going into the Game Master's Guide, which we spoke of briefly, uh, we have some expanded options of other things you can spend it on. Um, and Doom, although it is very monster-focused, uh, it can be used in any encounter, right? Where anytime that you would call for initiative and do round by round, you know, giving players disadvantage against a trap or something like that, it, you still can use it outside of monsters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but that's but where it started, right? It started as a way to say, kind of like legendary actions or or you know, abilities that recharge. It was meant to be a, a little bit of a power up on the GM side um, or an option to heighten uh, the tension or the suspense or just say, well, well, this is it, right? We're going for it. I'm spending my doom point on this breath weapon or the lich really doesn't want you to make this save. So, oh, with disadvantage. Well, and the great thing about it being optional is that it allows a game master to kind of tailor the encounter to the players. So if you know that your players are not very optimized, they're yeah. just kind of there to, they're like, yeah. I if you just don't want to keep track of it, right? Like if you're yeah. like, yeah, you know, that's all fun, but these monsters have plenty and I'm just a beginning jam game master. I don't need to keep track of Doom. There's really, yeah, it's frosting. It's a cherry on top. It's not required. Yeah. And I, and I, and it's definitely great for those players that like they optimize everything. They got to oh be like, gosh. all right, I'm rolling up in here. I got a 25 AC DM. What are you doing? Right. <laughs> um, it's like, well, I have doom now. So. <laughs> and also what's your will save. Right? <laughs> and it's, I, and I think that like the, it being optional also allows for like game masters to pick and choose which encounters they want to use it in. Maybe you save it mm -hmm. for big boss fights or like a very like particular kind of like thing. It, it's, it's, it's such a versatile thing that I think like a lot of the thing, uh, like a lot of the ways in which you can use doom points that you're talking about were things that game masters were probably already doing just like behind the screen like okay i need a balance this encounter uh, on the fly right but now you've given it cold hard mechanics that are both player and game master facing now so that when a player goes man why does it what does this thing keep happening this uh, the gm can go well it's happening because of this you did this i got this i spent it and now this is happening and that kind of sure. fun back and forth that i think is uh, will feel good for game masters, but probably also feel a little better for players once they, now that it is both facing both directions, which I think is really cool. Yeah, it definitely has some fun interplay with luck, right? So it's not just the the players that get a fun new extra points if things don't go their way. Because there are times every game master, you sit there and you whiff every roll, right? Like mm -hmm. this this thing just cannot hit a single player at all, right? And sometimes you really just need that advantage. Just be like, before this creature <laughs> dies, please let it do something. <laughs> let it do one cool thing. Let it do That's one all I want. Cool thing. <laughs> I've definitely had encounters where I've had big bad, everything is going right. The player does one thing that is like a concentration roll that just stops them from doing anything for the rest of the encounter. It's like, well, right? there goes that. Uh, this I was guess. the silent spell on a... On a I think it was a Toma Beast Lorelei. It was some sort of siren. Like, mm -hmm. really? Really? You put out the, si <laughs> the silence spell for this encounter. <laughs> all right. And they just walked all over it. Right? It's like all the Sonic stuff was toast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were looking forward to that encounter as the GM all day. I was like, yeah, they're on a ship. They're sailing down the coast. I'm going to be luring sailors off the boat to their watery doom. This is going to be so like, cool. Silence. Oh, okay. Great. Well, great. all right. Thanks, I did guys. not see that coming. I haven't seen you pull that out in a very long time. Yeah. I forgot you had that spell. 
Uh, amazing. Um, yeah, speaking of spells, though, for players, if uh, if people want to know a secret, now don't tell anybody else. Oh, but just, because, yeah. right? Just just between us. But here at CoboldCon, we here at CoboldCon. Right, right. Because we've added all of these bonus actions and reactions to a lot of the creatures, there's a third circle spell that might get more use now than fireball, and that's slow. Because yes. slow limits you to just an action or a bonus action. And now that monsters have multiple things that they can do, now instead of it being like you slow the monster and, well, I'll still just use multi-attack and claw claw bite you, it's like now it's like I can claw claw bite or I can do my cool bonus action or I can do my reaction. Or actually with slow, I think it removes your reaction. Mm -hmm. So now, like, I think slow is going to be much more impactful on games. Yep. And so for the wizards that prefer utility spells or like to have those kinds of things like silence and stuff and taking that instead of like Scorching Ray or whatever, right? Like now you can take those utility things and still have a huge impact on the combat. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. That's, I didn't even think about that. That's right. You're going to find a few quirks in there, the way the Monster Vault and Player's Guide interact. It's so good. Um as uh, we're moving on to like kind of our, our, our final questions here, um, if there are any, we're, we're running a little short on time, so we'll try to get one or two uh, 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 questions from the chat. So if you have any, please send them. Make sure they're great. Um, um, but uh, talk. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the accessibility of the monster vault because with some old classic monsters and a lot of new monsters, right? There's going to come a little bit of like, okay, how do I use, A, how do I use these? What are these? All of that good stuff. Um, there's the introduction of the, the pronunciation key for the monsters and then art descriptions right. in the PDF. How do all of these come together to help make the Monster Vault much more usable for people? So the, the fun thing about making things like Tomo Beast and Creature Codex was that um, as the as the editor developer on a lot of those, I just know how to spell it. I don't need to know how to pronounce it. And then people are like, so how do you say this? I'm like, I don't know. I just I know how to spell it. Uh, well, so then we made a pronunciation key because we get asked that a lot. And, you know, the more unique monsters that you put out there, especially because a lot of monsters are based off of like folklore and things like that, you want to be able to pronounce it correctly or at least do some justice to it. So mm -hmm. the pronunciation keys, we added those. So in those tables we were talking about earlier uh, in the creature type section uh, yep. that include like their allies and everything, that's also where the pronunciation key is housed. So now mm -hmm. um, you can just, now you know how to say the name, right? And it's all spelled out for you, which is great. Um, and yeah, that's, for us, it's just a fun thing to do because we get asked, but it's also a very good accessibility tool like you're talking about, Kendo, that it, it helps people um, who might not necessarily have English as their, their first language or something like that, right? It helps them pronounce the monsters. The most um, important pronunciation thing is it's dro, not drow. What? For Frank some of the himself, monsters. Wait, so actually, Frank Manser himself told me that when I was 12, so I will go to my grave and I will fight anyone. You're taking Frank's word for it, are you? <laughs> Frank, Frank knew Gary. It was Dro. So all you Drow fans, I believe I'm it. To say it, huh. we're wrong. Well, <laughs> good news is for some of the monsters that do have uh, multiple uh, popular pronunciations, both pronunciations are listed in the key. Yeah. Okay. So Drow and Dro are listed for yes. that creature in the pronunciation key. So we got both. Gith Yankee and Gith Yankee. <laughs> Yep, yep. Well, Ganassi we and Genasi. Yeah, 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 potato, yeah. potato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking of all of the the the, the pronunciation arguments I've been in over the yep. years. Of like... Exits a chittle. And, and, and we, you know, we don't want to say 100. percent It's pronounced this way, so we give you options, right? Like everybody's got their their camp on the pronunciations. It was a really fun key to make, actually, because I'm originally from the south, and I put together a lot of the pronunciations. Uh, mm -hmm. So I made sure that we had several team members over, like look over it, so that it wasn't too southern sounding. <laughs> some of the pronunciation. <laughs> it's a bit more varied. And I was using the correct stuff, so that's great. Um, and then you mentioned the art descriptions yeah. in the PDF. Um, that I think came about from Hacks Unplugged 2019. We had uh, a couple come up to the booth, and they asked if our PDFs were screen reader friendly and accessible. Uh, and me being relatively new to all of this was like, uh, I don't know, maybe, possibly. So, um, and then I discovered that no, they're not. 
Um, so thank you, whoever, wherever you may be, if you're still even paying attention to Cobalt Press, uh, because that kind of prompted us to start looking at what, what does it mean for us to make our PDFs more screen reader friendly, um, to make them more accessible. And a lot of times it's just as simple as making sure that we've got a, like a little one sentence description on each of the monster art, right? So that you've got the screen reader can read out what the monster looks like or describing like what the half page picture is, right? And it's stuff that um, those of us that don't use screen readers don't even think about, mm -hmm. um, but it makes a big difference for the people that do use them. And it's a yep. relatively small lift on us um, and it just makes it so much better. Yeah, and sometimes they work as captions because you're like, what is that art? Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's just but, more useful for everyone, regardless. Yep. Yeah, generally. I mean, it's kind yeah. of like putting subtitles on TV and video, right? Like, I pretty much just watch films with subtitles on because the audio is sometimes so muddy or someone's running the leaf blower, and I'm just like, whatever. Subtitles, it's fine. It's yeah. just one more channel, which is nice to have. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Amazing. Um, well, we are here in the, I don't see any questions. No big questions? Oh, okay. As That's the, easy. We did everything yeah, perfectly. We did yeah. everything perfectly. So We're I will awesome ask my final question. Are there any Ooh. plans to release additional content for the Monster Vault in the future? Ooh, I know secret plans to release more Monster Vault stuff. I don't know how much I can talk about. Cobalt well, Press is known for monster books. We've done Tome of Beast 1, Tome of Beast 2, Tome of Beast 3. So, nope. No more monsters. <laughs> no more monsters. We're done. No We're monstered out forever. Right. The Monster Vault is the shining pinnacle of monsters. We've done every single monster there ever could be. I think, like I said earlier, you know, we've done a great big lift on Monster Vault. We're really happy and excited about it. And we'd like to put monsters down for a little while. But we're coming back, yes. Um, <laughs> I think, I, I think I heard this from an editor that there was some interest in taking some creatures from the Monster Vault and turning them into, oh, I don't know, expanded blog stuff, or doing something around those monsters in the Game Master Guide. But that's all I know. <laughs> I don't know. Megan probably knows more. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you, you, cause with Tales of the Valiant, it just released, but it is only two books, right? Um, if you are hungry for more than the 403 monsters that are in that book, um, we do still have Creature Codex, Tome of Beast 1, Tome of Beast 2, Tome of Beast 3. Uh, and they are all compatible, right? We are 5e compatible. And we released the conversion guide today for 5e. Yes. To so if you feel the for need free. to convert, <laughs> for free. yeah, it's a free conversion guide. Should so have charged for that, Megan. Should have right. charged. <laughs> 20 bucks. No. That stuff's gold. I no. read it. It's really useful. <laughs> yeah, it is. And that's and so because they're compatible with each other, you don't have to do any conversion if you don't want to. And the guide clearly states that. Uh, but it does give you some guidance on doing conversions if you did want to grab one of the monsters from our other monster books and use that in your game. Super quick, super easy. There are a lot of mimics. A lot of mimics lot of need mimics. to come over. Like we've got, got the baseline mimic, but you know me, I always want thirty more mimics. That's why. Do you? <laughs> okay, maybe I don't. Maybe <laughs> I'm mimicked out. <laughs> a lot of people like the carnivorous ship. Okay. The carnivorous yes. ship is hilarious and deserves to be in every pirate adventure ever. It, it spits <laughs> cannonballs. I mean, it, it's mostly just the undigested metal that it eats from eating ships, but it spits cannonballs. You know, if I had used the mimic ship instead of a siren that silent spell it wouldn't have would done not have been so effective it wouldn't have been yeah. so you don't hear the cannonballs being spit at you all right right <laughs> <laughs> um there actually did we have some more questions yes we did have some more questions uh oh, so we'll, right. we'll we'll go through these uh real quick uh first question here uh are there any lore connections to midgard for any of the monsters in the monster vault or are they all primarily within so. the labyrinth? They are. Yeah, well, not, this is not directly. No. Yeah, this is very much a any world, your world. It's not a Midgard product by any means. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that things like the Void Dragon started as Midgard flavored monsters. 
but they've sort of expanded and gotten out in the world and um but everything in the monster vault fits into midgard pretty well yeah because they're because all the the lore is much more um open mm -hmm. you know it really can fit in any world so yeah everything if you play in midgard you could definitely use all these monsters in midgard uh, but as far as saying this monster is specifically in this region of midgard uh, no the monster vault does not include any any of that and just before anyone says it because i know there's tons of midgard fans that does not mean we're abandoning Midgard. Midgard is still yeah. very much alive. More Midgard is coming. I see it all the time. People say, like, Did, is Midgard gone? No. <laughs> no, no. Not Every Monday on the blog, we talk about Midgard. Every editorial meeting, we're like, well, is this a Midgard thing? Hmm. Right. <laughs> there are pro out just this past January, we put out that big Warlock Grimoire, oh, which is 100% oh, yeah, Midgard. Yeah. Grimoire is 100% Midgard content. So, yes, it continues. And, and, I think in future products that that will be a thing. But as the core rules, yeah, we really wanted to keep it open and universal. Yeah. Yep. Uh, next question here. Uh, how significant is the difference between the creatures in the Monster Vault, like the Duragar, Dwarves, Deep Gnomes, and Kobolds, from the versions of them in the Player's Guide? Or are they similar? So uh, it depends on which aspect you're talking about, because we did have to create all new lore for all of them. So we definitely created a lot of lore that made them more unique. Um, for example, the Durgar have lore about them being much more militaristic as a society, like their martial law ruled, uh, and they spend a lot of their time in the depths of the world fighting off aberrations and other things that go bump in the night. Mm -hmm. um, so they have lore related to that. As far as mechanical differences, every creature got at least one new cool thing. That was one of our big goals when we were looking at all the monsters, is all the SRD monsters got at least one cool new thing. Usually it was a bonus action or a reaction, but sometimes it was just as simple as, now the rust monster can climb on walls. Why couldn't it before? I don't know, but now it can, right? <laughs> mm -hmm, right. Um, you know, it is simple little changes like that that make the monsters um, more versatile uh, for your environments. But yeah, so each of those uh, that you listed did get changes. Um, but they should not play over like super different. Um, right. But part of that question was about the player's guide. Is that, did I hear that correctly? Uh, yes. The, like the kobolds in the monster vault versus the player's lineage. Versus the mm -hmm. player lineage of kobold. And I mean, they line up neatly, but obviously one's for players and one's for monsters. So there's some, yeah. 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 I mean, there's distinctions. A lot of a lot of tabletop RPGs, or specifically in our, our type of tabletop RPG, are a bit uh, asymmetrical, if you're yeah. if you all are familiar with the style of asymmetrical gaming. Uh, so stat blocks are going to be a little different. Now, the Cobalt does have scurry in both both instances. Right. They right? have the connections. Cobalt. Yeah, the, so they do look like the same creature. They're not super different. Uh, but as far as what a game master would use a kobold for versus what a player would use a kobold for are going to be different. So some of their mechanics are different. They yeah. should still feel like the same creature. I think they absolutely do. But yeah, different sides of the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understood. And then uh, I think our last question here um, is, did any of the creatures receive the Vorpal crit ability? Always fun when a character can lose a hand. Ah, uh, I don't remember a Vorpal crit. I, I don't think so. I know that we've put some out in some of our other monster books that have like a you lose a limb or something. You on lose a, a limb, but I think you got to go to Tomo Beast for that. Yeah, um, that's too bad. We're not ever going to do another monster book. Or we can... <laughs> no more monsters. Right, or we yeah. could bring that back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't have that. But there are other things uh, that are certainly. Uh, in there and horrifically horrifying. Um, I, I'm not sure which one survived playtest, but, you know, look at the purple worm. Look at the rust monster. Mm -hmm. uh, there are things that will make you say, oh. Um, some of the names are familiar, I'd say, but Megan was saying there are new bonus actions. There are reactions. There are, um, there are twists on the old familiar. So you know most of it. But there's always one thing you might not know. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as, so if if your desire for something like Vorpal is because you want something uh, post-combat that kind of lasts and lingers, uh, we do have several creatures that have curses and diseases and things like that. So it's not just 
a one and done type thing with the creature. We do have some creatures that linger, um, assuming that that would be the main purpose of I want Vorpal because I want them to have something that lasts past the encounter. Mm -hmm. um, there are plenty of curses and diseases that, that help you out with that. Amazing. Well, uh, thank you all so much uh, for being here, answering these questions, diving into the monster vault. I know I'm very excited to, uh, to, to, to dive through it, pull out some of my favorite ones, and I hope all of you watching uh, feel the same. Uh, thank you all uh, for watching, and um, CobaltCon's not done yet. We still got plenty, plenty, more, to, plenty more to do. Um, yes. But yes, thanks thank for you. all the great questions. It's been fun talking about monsters. You basically can't shut me up. So, <laughs> I saw someone earlier saying that they love watching your face light up whenever you get to talk about monsters. It's my favorite thing. So this is my favorite part of quote. Well, mm, so many favorite parts. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, thanks for having us. Of course, of course. Hey. Who would I be if I didn't invite the people who helped make Tales of the Valiant happen? Um, I'd be not very good at my job, uh, is, what, is what I would say. Um, What's up next, Ken Kendo? Yes, uh, next up, uh, after a quick break, we're going to do another bio. Please get up, get some water, but we will be back. Because if you are interested in what does it feel like to make a character in Tales of the Valiant, you're going to be able to see just that. Uh, with uh, another fellow kobold, me and Kim are going to show you how to make a character in Tales of the Valiant using the shard platform. Oh, so tabletop, sweet. So yes, if that is uh, if you've been like, oh, I want to learn how to make a character, and like, oh, there's all these virtual, th all these new VTTs that are going to be using it. How am I going to do it? You're about Here's to find one. Out. So yeah. stay tuned, and we will see you all after the break. See y'all.